Hello, everyone. We're going to just wait a few seconds here while people uh, pop into the Zoom cells. Then we'll go ahead and get started. All right. Hello and welcome. I am Dr. Jeff Katzman, the Director of Education here at Silver Hill Hospital. Thank you all so much for joining us today for our virtual grand rounds on social justice in psychiatry. In a moment, I will pass over uh, the, the baton to my co-host today, Dr. Amir Garakani, to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Shim. Uh, first, I wanna go over a few housekeeping details. First off, of course, we would love to hear from you. So at, at the end of the lecture, we will have some time for questions and we welcome your comments as well. So to submit a question, please do so at any time during the presentation using the Q&A link at the bottom of your screen. Uh, just press that and type in the question and we'll get to it. For anyone wishing to receive CME or CEC credits, please complete the evaluation survey that automatically pops up in the browser as the webinar ends. And we will also email you a copy to make sure you got it. Finally, uh, disclosures, uh, no Silver Hill Hospital planners of this activity have any relevant financial relationships to disclose in relation to this presentation. Dr. Kirakani, I now pass the baton over to you. Thank you, Dr. Katzman. I, uh, I'm very appreciative to be here. Uh, I'd like to start off by saying that I've known Dr. Ruth Shim since I believe it was 2005. Um, and I believe Ruth, we met at the APA meeting in Atlanta when we were both uh, doing the uh, leadership fellowship. And since Ruth uh, was, uh, had gone to medical school and trained there and from that area, she showed us around uh, some of the best places to eat. And I just remember the thing I remember most distinctly was one day walking from the hotel to the conference and like being drenched in sweat because it is so humid <laughs> in May there. But I had a I have a lot of really interesting stories to tell. But I will I will just say um, that let me start by just introducing Dr. Shim and I want to tell an interesting anecdote in a moment. But uh, Dr. Ruth Shim is a is the Luke and Grace Kim Professor of Cultural Psychiatry. I'm professor of clinical psychiatry at uh, University of California, Davis, where she also serves as the Dean of Diverse and edu Inclusive Education at the School of Medicine. She received her MPH from the Rollins School of Public Health and her MD, both from Emory University, where she also did her training. She's a member of the Board of Trustees for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the American Association for Community Psychiatry and serves on the Research and Evaluation Committee of the California Mental Health Over Services Oversight and Accountability Commission. Um, she's also on the editorial board of JAMA Psychiatry, Psychiatric Services, where she oversees a column, a Community Mental Health Journal, and American Psychiatric Publishing, and is co-editor of, of two books, of Social Determinants of Mental Health and the recently published Social Injustice and Mental Health. Uh, and just, you know, personally, excellent books that have been really well received. Uh, former, she's also a former fellow of the Executive Leadership and Academic Medicine Program and an at-large member of the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine Forum on Mental Health and Substance Use Disorders. Uh, in 2021, she was a recipient of the NAMI Exemplary Psychiatrist Award and the UC Davis Health Dean's Award for Excellence in Mentoring. Uh, her focus is on mental health disparities and inequities, and she provides clinical psychiatric care to, in the UC Davis Early Diagnosis and Preventative Treatment Clinic. Uh, Dr. Shim has a very extensive biography. I could go on. She, she's very humble because this is just scratching the surface. She's published many papers, has been you know, a member of many honorary organizations, including the APA. Uh, and she's a member of GAP, Group for Advancement Psychiatry, which is another place where I've uh, gotten to know her. And early on, when we were having discussion about the, the issue of, of social justice and injustice, there was a lot of discussion about uh, bringing speakers to address this. And the, uh, the president of Silver Hill, Dr. Andrew Gerber, mentioned first and foremost, Dr. Ruth Shin. And the first response was, well, I know her. <laughs> I will certainly invite her. And, and since that time, she has given talks at 
the American College of Psychiatrists at Yale and given grand rounds and talks all over and has written extensively, including a, an excellent article in the American Journal of Psychiatry on this very topic. The fact that we have to do this and, and have somebody like Dr. Shem talk about these things and remind us about our history is, is problematic in its own right, but I'm just glad that she's here to do it. It sort of reminds me, I was reading an article of, of George Will, the excellently uh, well-known conservative who speaks so highly about you know conservatives. He said he didn't know about the Tulsa massacres until he turned 80. And I think that's sort of a lament of, of how people who were supposedly very educated and worldly and knowledgeable cannot know about our own ugly history in this country. Uh, so I'm just glad Dr. Shim is here. And I just wanna tell one funny anecdote. I When we were at the APA, uh, components meetings in DC, we were at a, at a very nice um, Ethiopian restaurant in Georgetown. And I don't, I have a lot of phobia about eating in public. I've talked about my anxieties in previous talks, but Ruth was so nice and made me feel really kind of comfortable. And it was a really great, you know, environment of the fellows. We all got along wonderfully, but I just recall how nice she was. And um, we were doing origami together because I told her I know how to do origami and she called me out on it. <laughs> so she made me fold a crane right up there at the table and it was a very funny moment, uh, but I, I'm really happy that I got to know her and uh, we've stayed in touch and I, I can just say I'm really honored that she's here to give a talk. So I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Shim. Thank you so much, Dr. Garakani, for that introduction and um, I um, until you brought it up, I had forgotten about the origami story, but now it, it's that memory is coming back uh, to me and I remember it quite well. And um, I really very much appreciate uh, the time that we have spent together uh, in the APA. Um, you, you mentioned that I am a member of the APA, but famously I am not, I am no longer yeah. a member of was the APA. Was a member, APA. yes. <laughs> but Sorry. I previously was in fact a, a member of the APA. But thank you so much for, for that introduction. And I'm, I'm so pleased to be here with all of you today. Um, and uh, we have a lot to cover in a very short amount of time. So I think I'm gonna just jump right in. So, I, I just wanna make sure that uh, we know that our disclo my disclosure is that I have nothing to disclose. And, and I really like to point this out. I actually have nothing to disclose, but um, I do have a lot of disclaimers to make. And so I'm going to disclose nothing but disclaim a lot. But before we talk about my disclaimers, um, I'd really like to go over the learning objectives. We're going to talk about and define social justice, mental health inequities, and structural racism. We're gonna consider how structural and institutional forces impact psychology psychiatry, and we're going to develop solutions for addressing social injustice and achieving mental health equity in psychiatry. So the disclaimer um, is, I, as I mentioned, a bit long. Um, the first thing that we need to talk about is that when we're talking about issues of social justice, of racism, that we have to acknowledge that, that it's a difficult and uncomfortable topic. Um, and because of that, as we talk and we uh, work through this um, presentation today, you might start to notice certain complex feelings coming to the fore. Um, and some of those feelings might include things like guilt, anger, resentment, or defensiveness. Um, and one of the things that may happen during this talk is that you may perceive me of accusing you of being racist or sexist or any number of other horrible things. Um, you also may feel during the course of this talk that I have some sort of specific political agenda that I'm trying to advance or that I lack objectivity. Um, and I would just want to point out, and the reason I have to make this disclaimer is because all of these things have been brought up before um, when we talk about these issues. Um, and I think it's perfectly normal and natural, but I, I really want us to recognize that as educators, as uh, mental health professionals, if we cannot acknowledge these difficult emotions um, and move forward around these topics, um, I don't know how we can expect other people to move forward as well. So, so I, I think we should acknowledge that. Um, one of the things that we are going to be doing um, throughout this talk is one of the ways that we can work through that acknowledgement has to do with self-reflection and learning to practice self-reflection, learning to spend some time thinking inwardly about um, what you're experiencing. So we'll, we'll be practicing some of that to kind of move through some of that discomfort. <laughs> 
And then the other thing we have to, I have to disclaim is that it's really hard to talk about these topics. Um, and it's because we have been socialized to believe that it's not polite to talk about racism or injustice or oppression. Um, and many health professionals and mental health professionals most have not really been taught about the connection between oppression, injustice and health. And so that makes it difficult to talk about these topics. But one of the other reasons why it's so difficult is because there's so much complexity around talking about race um, after the death of George Floyd, uh, we saw an incredible rise in the number of protests against racial injustice throughout the country. Um, and many people said, oh, this is a racial reckoning that the United States is going through. Um, but the unfortunate thing is that what we've seen over time is that it really didn't, it really wasn't the racial reckoning that we were hoping for. Um, and this uh, study shows that um, white people are actually um, less supportive of the Black Lives Matter movement um, than they were in the beginning of 2020. So prior to George Floyd's death, there were more people that supported Black Lives Matter than they are currently, um, white people currently in, in the country. Um, there's actually less support for Black Lives Matter now. And so that really gives you a, a like a a glimpse into how challenging these issues are and kind of what we're up against in terms of trying to talk about these issues, the fatigue that sets in and, and how some people really wanna move on or um, kind of move to a different topic. So, um, and so one of the things that I have found to be very helpful when thinking about these topics, when trying to move forward are, are the words of James Baldwin. So he said, I'm not interested in anybody's guilt Guilt is a luxury that we can no longer afford. I know you didn't do it and I didn't do it either, but I am responsible for it because I am a man and a citizen of this country and you are responsible for it for the very same reason. So that is the extent of the disclaimer and with that we can move into the um, presentation. Uh, so uh, one of the things that we're talking about today is this concept of social justice. And social justice, um, again, is a, a comment that uh, a, a concept that is really quite politically charged. Um, when we think about social justice, there's a lot of um, discussion about um, social justice warriors and all sorts of kind of other negative connotations that are associated with the term. Um, and so we, we talk about social justice and, and we don't always um, kind of know the role that, that it plays in, um, in our medical professions. So it, about a, uh, two years ago, almost exactly two years ago, an, an op-ed came out in the Wall Street Journal and uh, it was by a physician um, at the um, University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine, who was Associate Dean of Curriculum. Um, and his name, uh, Dr. Stanley Goldfarb, um, he, he said that he was really concerned about the direction that medical education is going because he said that um, in, in this byline here at, at, at woke medical schools, curricula are increasingly focused on social justice rather than, rather than treating illness. So one of the things he said in this op-ed was, why have medical schools become a target for inculcating social policy when the stated purpose of medical education since Hippocrates has been to develop individuals who know how to cure patients? And then he also said that curricula will increasingly focus on climate change, social inequities, gun violence, bias, and other progressive causes only tangentially related to treating illness. And so will many of your doctors in coming years. He really kind of sounded the alarm um, was very concerned about the direction he felt that medicine was going in. Um, and several of his colleagues also at the University of Pennsylvania penned a response in the Philadelphia Inquirer to this op-ed. They said uh, that social and health policies have always determined who gets sick and who gets care and where and how. Understanding the social drivers of health and illness is not peripheral or tangential to health. It is the key to diagnosing and meeting a patient's fundamental needs. And I think that's really critical when we think about um, how, how much social injustice exists in the world and why it's so important and relevant um, when we think about mental health. And so if we are going to kind of wade into this controversial space, I think it's really important that we have a working definition 
of social justice. Social justice is a philosophical term. Um, it comes um, from the philosopher David Miller. One of the things he said social justice was, was the distribution of good or advantages and bad or disadvantages in society, and more specifically how these things should be distributed in society. So he said it was concerned with the ways that resources are allocated to people by social institutions. And then the other thing he said was uh, the other thing um, that the other definition of social, uh, social justice comes from John Rawls. And he said that social justice is assuring the protection of equal access to liberties, rights, and opportunities, as well as taking care of the least advantaged members of society. I think that that piece is extremely critical because when we talk about people with mental illness, they are in fact often the least advantaged members of our society. So social justice is really about how do we make sure that we're caring for those people that are most marginalized and most oppressed in our society. So I mentioned it's difficult to talk about these topics, but when we um, wade into the discussion about race, it becomes even more difficult. Um, and when we think about how race and ethnicity is conceptualized in psychiatry and mental health, um, it's quite challenging. Um, what we know about race is that it is a social and political construct. And what I mean by that is that race cannot be accurately biologically or genetically categorized because it has been constructed for the express purpose of um, perpetuating hierarchies, of, of, um, of, of um, making slavery um, seem like a reasonable thing. Um, it was in, in fact constructed um, in our society and by political forces, the concept of race to justify things like slavery to justify oppression of certain groups. And when I say that race cannot be accurately or biologically, uh, cannot be accurately biologically or genetically categorized, what I mean there is that we can't draw somebody's blood, um, we can't run a genetic test and actually determine definitively what somebody's race is because there is so no, no such thing as a biological or a genetic categorization of race. This is something that people really struggle with and I'm, I'm really actually kind of shocked um, that really intelligent people really um, have challenges understanding the fact that race is not a biological or a, genetical con a genetic construct, but a social and political one. Um, what we know is that even though it can't be accurately biologically or genetically categorized, it is a rough and very imprecise proxy for a number of other things, including culture, genetics, and socioeconomic status. The concern about that is it's very imprecise. And again, when we think about medicine, when we think about psychiatry, I think our hope would be that we're trying to be as precise as possible in um, evaluating and diagnosing and treating our, our patients and treating our clients. And yet we're using this extremely imprecise proxy and then we're taking that proxy and we're using race to confirm a number of assumptions of prejudices and biases about our patients. So that, um, that is really kind of a very disturbing trend in the way that we see race and the way that we apply race in psychiatry. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on. So I'd like us to ponder this particular quote. Um, it says, African-Americans have higher incarceration rates higher unemployment, lower incomes, lower home and business ownership, less education, less healthcare, more disease, and lower life expectancy than whites. If you believe blacks are naturally dumb, sick, criminal, you have your answer for these discrepancies. If however, you resist using stereotypes to make sense of your world, institutional racism provides a very practical and very traceable explanation for the inferior societal position of African Americans. The reason why I think this quote is so uh, important is because although we are all very well-meaning people, um, we often, I think, collectively as a society, look at the inferior societal position of African Americans and we don't necessarily apply, um, routinely apply the explanation of institutional racism as an explanation for that inferior societal position. We tend to default to this thought that perhaps there is some sort of intrinsic, some sort of biological, some sort of genetic um, predisposition to being dumb, sick, criminal, inferior. 
And perhaps that is really the thing that is driving all these outcomes, all these negative outcomes that we see in this particular population. And so let's talk a little bit about how we kind of collectively as a society got to the mindset where we um, tend to think of certain racial groups as truly inferior to other, to other groups. Um, so this of course is a painting, a famous painting, the signers of the Declaration of Independence. Um, and we all know that the Declaration of Independence are the words uh, by, upon which this country was founded such powerful words that we're very familiar with that we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So this, um, this beautiful ideal by which this country was founded, unfortunately, um, really is uh, kind of founded kind of on a lie. Um, because when these gentlemen gather together um, to sign this declaration and to declare that we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, they were really being very specific about who they were talking about. First of all, they, they were talking about the men in this room. They were specifically referring to men and not women as created equal. And they were specifically referring to white men, the people that were here in this particular space, that those men were created equal. Um, and then they systematically created laws and built a society that reflected that belief system that this particular group of men were created equal and all other people were inferior in some way to those people. And in fact, we founded this country on this idea of this meritocracy of this American dream that if you just work hard enough, you can achieve what you want in life. And again, I think that that applied very much to the men in this room, but it certainly did not apply to all groups and all people um, in the United States. And then um, about 80 years later, we saw the origins of the psychiatric pseudoscience that, that really kind of is a foundation for the way we think about people today. And so a physician by the name of Samuel Cartwright uh, came up with this concept of um, several conditions that, several mental health conditions that he described in enslaved African people. Um, so one of those conditions was something he called drapetomania. He said that drapetomania was this illness in which an enslaved black person was trying to escape their captivity from slavery. And he described the very act of trying to escape captivity as a mental illness. Um, and so what he said about this particular mental illness of drapetomania is that if any one or more of them at any time are inclined to raise their heads to a level with their master or overseer, humanity and their own good requires that they should be punished until they fall into that submissive state which was intended for them to occupy. They have only to be kept in that state and treated like children to prevent and cure them from running away. Um, so this particular illness um, really, this description of this illness really highlights um, the, the, what a failure of, or an erasure of context, what that ends up doing um, to people if we're really unclear or unaware of the context, the socio-historical context by what is happening in people's lives. We can make very wrong assumptions about behaviors and, and motivations for behaviors. Um, and then the other condition he described was something called dysesthesia ethiopica. He said that this was a disease of rascality um, or the, the natural tendency of enslaved black people to be lazy, to not want to work hard. Um, and again, I'm, I'm reminding us all of that quote about how if we believe that um, black people are naturally dumb, sick or lazy because this is really where the origins of that mindset really started to, to set in. So this idea that um, that enslaved black people really didn't wanna work very hard. And what he said about this disease, he said the disease is the natural offspring of Negro liberty, the liberty to be idle, to wallow in filth and to indulge in improper food and drinks. After the prescribed course of treatment, the slave will look grateful and thankful to the white man whose compulsory power has restored his sensation and dispelled the mist that clouded his intellect. So I wanna point out that for both of these conditions, the prescribed course of treatment was whipping um, because he saw this as the most effective treatment for um, these particular conditions. But I also uh, wanna state that uh, when we're thinking about dysesthesia ethiopica, 
Um, this is a condition that um, really makes no sense because what we know about enslaved black people is that they were working um, far beyond and working much more productively than um, kind of normal human um, people are supposed to be working. They were working and, and, and putting output um, at extremely high levels of productivity. Um, and in addition to that, they were often working at this extreme pace um, with, with kind of no breaks, no um, uh, attention to their comfort, and also many times highly in, in highly malnourished conditions because oftentimes um, the, uh, the um, slave owners were not particularly focused on making sure that um, their slaves were fed properly or properly nourished. They were trying to save money in those respects. So all of these conditions that Cartwright described really kind of demonstrate the lack of context, but also really help us to understand where the origins of certain long held beliefs that we have about certain race, racial groups um, really started to take over. And so I wanna take a minute to de define and contrast two definitions. One is this concept of health disparities. Health disparities are defined as differences in health status among distinct segments of the population, including differences that occur by gender, race or ethnicity, education or income, disability or where you live. And I'd like to contrast that with the definition of health inequities, which are disparities in health that are the result of systemic avoidable and unjust social and economic policies and practices that create barriers to opportunity. It's really important that we think about the difference between these two definitions, because the health disparities definition, which I'll just point out that health disparities is the term we use all the time in the United States. And in all other countries, interestingly enough, when we talk about differences in health, we um, other countries say health inequities. But here in the United States, when we talk about differences in health, we, we define them as health disparities. Um, it's not an incorrect definition, but one of the things I think it's important to know when we talk about health disparities is that health disparities do not state anything about what the cause of the difference is. It just says that there's a difference in health. It doesn't say anything about the cause. And if it doesn't say anything about the cause, the risk there is that we tend to default to intrinsic or biological or, or other types of kind of innate explanations for why those differences exist. So if we don't state firmly what the cause of the difference is, instead of understanding that there are systemic avoidable and unjust social and economic policies and practices that lead to differences in health, we tend to think that maybe certain groups are somehow biologically, genetically inferior. And that's why we see these differences in health. Or we might say something like, oh, certain groups have different cultural practices. Um, they think differently about things. And those different beliefs and those different cultural values, those are the things that are driving these differences in health. Rather than recognize that for 99.9% .9 of the differences in health that we see, and particularly differences as it relates to mental health, for 99.9% .9 of those differences, those differences are the result of systemic avoidable and unjust social economic and economic policies and practices. So I want to again remind you that we're going to spend some time self reflecting here. Um, and so um, one of the first questions we might think about to ourselves and, and really just kind of ponder is that when we're thinking about differences in mental health outcomes among different racial and ethnic populations, are we thinking about mental health disparities? Or are we thinking about mental health inequities? When we're noticing certain um, differences in prevalence rates and incidence rates and differences in outcomes um, as it relates to certain populations, how are we explaining those differences? Um, are we thinking about systemic avoidable and unjust policies and practices? Or are we tending to default to this idea that maybe there are certain cultural or biological reasons why we see these differences? Okay, so this all then relates to the concept of the social determinants of mental health. And so I want to define that. Um, the social determinants are the societal, environmental, and economic conditions that impact and affect mental health outcomes across various populations. These conditions are shaped by the distribution of money, power, and resources at global, national, and local levels, which are themselves influenced by policy choices. And finally, the social determinants of health are prominently responsible for the health disparities and inequities that are seen both within and among populations. Um, so basically I have kind of come to this work 
um, in thinking about this through a, a, a series of, of books that have helped me to like really shape my opinions about this. And so the first book, The Social Determinants of Mental Health is work that I uh, co-edited with uh, Dr. Michael Compton. Um, and really that book was really about how do we take all of the available evidence that we know about all of the various social determinants and really connect them to the poor mental health outcomes that we see in society. So we were really set about to gather all of the evidence um, around social determinants of mental health. And after doing that work, after thinking about and, and looking at all of these social determinants over and over, I started to understand that there were really some underlying um, patterns, some key factors that were really consistently contributing to the development of social determinants of mental health, which were then leading to these poor mental health outcomes. And what, what I um, began to understand is that it was social injustice that was really driving the creation of the social determinants of mental health. And so that is work um, that I did with Dr. Sarah Vinson um, most recently um, and compiled in uh, the book, Social Injustice and Mental Health. I wanna walk you all through now that whole conceptualiz conceptualization and how my thought process um, in, in thinking about that has worked. So at the very top of this figure, you see, um, poor mental health, um, adverse mental health outcomes and mental health inequities. As you move down the figure, um, you're moving further upstream, kind of one layer upstream with each, with each move down. Um, so, so right uh, before you get poor outcomes in mental health and mental health inequities, you see a number of risk factors. Um, and we know that a risk factor is something that precedes an illness and contributes to, um, increases the likelihood that you would develop uh, that particular illness. So risk factors include things like reduced options or poor, ch poor choices that people have. They could be behavioral risk factors. It could be physiologic stress responses. They could be psychological stress. In mental health, we spend a lot of time trying to identify risk factors. We do suicide risk assessments. We do violence risk assessments. We do a number of risk assessments. And, and the reason for that is because we wanna make sure we can intervene and decrease somebody's risk of developing these adverse mental health outcomes. Um, the problem, of course, what I came to understand in doing work around the social determinants of mental health is that if you're intervening at the level of the risk factor, you're actually intervening too late in the process because many of the things that set in that created the context for the risk factor are the things where the intervention should be focused. And so um, those things that, that set in prior to the development of the risk factor, um, Bruce Link and Joe Phelan call those things the fundamental causes of disease. Um, and Jeffrey Rose and Sir Michael Marmot call those things the causes of the causes. Um, but in general, all of those things are social determinants of health and, and really social determinants of mental health, which are really the same thing. So what you see here in this figure is if you move then further upstream, you see a number of different social determinants of mental health. They include things like adverse early life experiences and discrimination, but also low education and unemployment and poverty, and also homelessness and food insecurity and transportation insecurity and adverse features of the built environment and neighborhood disorder and climate change. So all of those social determinants of health and mental health are leading to a number of risk factors, which then lead to a number of um, poor mental health outcomes and mental health inequities. But again, as I've done, um, spent more time thinking about this work, I've come to understand that if you're intervening at the level of the social determinant, you're still intervening too late because there is a, there is a, number, of, a number of different contexts that really set the stage that are the causes of the causes of the causes. And, and that context is social injustice or unfair and unjust distribution of opportunity. And the thing that really drives the development of social injustice are two things. Social norms, which are our beliefs and our values about people. And the idea that we collectively have as a, as a society about who is valuable and who is um, worthy of advantage and who is less valuable and who is um, disadvantaged in our society, who, who should be disadvantaged in our society. So our social norms then lead us to pass public policies or certain laws that reflect those beliefs. 
Um, and so our social norms and public policies work together to create unfair and unjust distribution of opportunity that then leads to the social determinants of mental health, which then lead to a number of risk factors and then leads to a number of mental health, adverse mental health outcomes. So um, let's uh, use an example to kind of make that point. So when we think about people who use crack cocaine, and particularly when we think about people who use crack cocaine in the 1980s, we had a very um, distinct social norm about those people. Um, oftentimes we associated crack cocaine use with black people. And particularly when we thought about black people who use crack, we thought about if they were men, that they were dangerous, that they were criminals, that they were violent and aggressive. Um, and if they were women, they were often considered to be really bad mothers who are not interested in taking care of their children. And because of these social norms, because of these values um, that we attributed to this population, often driven by the media um, and, and a lot of kind of political, um, uh, political thoughts about this particular population. Um, based on those social norms and beliefs about the value of the people um, that were using this drug, we passed a number of laws that reflected this value system. Um, and one of them, um, one of the most significant laws that we passed was the Anti-Drug Abuse Act. So the Anti-Drug Abuse Act was passed in 1986 um, and it created a 100 to one jail sentencing disparity in the United States between crack cocaine and powder cocaine. And what, what that means, that 100 to one sentencing disparity is that somebody who was arrested with one gram of crack cocaine got the same jail sentence as somebody who was arrested with 100 grams of powder cocaine. So even though these drugs are the same chemical compound, the same drug, um, the use of one of these drugs had a significantly higher jail sentence that is, was associated with it and a much more punitive jail sentence, um, even though they're the same drug. And the thought was that the people who use crack are more dangerous, um, more concerning and need to be put into jail. Um, and so that is an example of how our social norms um, impact our public policies, which then lead to a number of um, unjust and unfair uh, distribution of opportunity in society. Um, in 2010, the jail sentence disparity uh, was reduced from 100 to one to 18 to one, but I think very disturbing is the fact that we still have a jail sentencing disparity. Um, and here in 2021, we're actively trying to reduce that to one to one, um, but it is still hard work to convince people um, of the importance of this. Um, and so what you saw with this jail sentencing disparity is that um, a number of social determinants um, resulted from these unfair and unjust policies. Um, and so what you saw is that um, a person who was arrested for crack cocaine was incarcerated. Um, if they got out of prison, if they got out of jail, um, they had difficulty finding employment. Um, they were kind of thrust into poverty. Um, with poverty comes uh, poor access to healthcare, poor access to food, um, and, and a number of other social determinants. But also in addition to all of those social determinants of mental health that affected the person that was incarcerated, you also see intergenerational effects because what we know is that an adverse childhood experience is having a parent who is incarcerated. Um, and so um, you saw this kind of intergenerational passing on of trauma that was the direct result of certain um, policies that we have created as a society that have disadvantaged certain populations. Um, the other um, issue that we find here is that we really think of crack cocaine as a criminal problem. We don't think of it as, um, a, as a public health issue. And, and this is kind of highlighted um, in Ernest Drucker in his, his book, A Plague of Prisons. He said the fundamental clinical accountability of drug treatment professionals to individual patients has been subordinated to the goals of the criminal justice system. So um, if we think about this, let's contrast our, our thoughts about how we deal with and think about crack cocaine with how we think about the opioid epidemic. Um, and and our, what are our social norms and values around people who use opioids? And one of the first things uh, that we can think of is that we don't consider opioid users to be criminals. We don't consider opioid users to be people who need to go to jail or who are bad mothers. And instead, we think of opioid use as a public health problem. And as a result, um, we have passed laws and policies that reflect 
those values, those social norms for that population. Um, and that has led to a very different way of approaching the opioid epidemic than the crack cocaine epidemic. So let's cover a couple of important concepts. Um, here are some principles that I think it's important for us to consider. The first is essentialism, which is the belief that there are these distinct and unchanging natural characteristics that define social groups and facilitate their categorization. The idea that we can place certain groups and certain populations into specific categories and that they can fit very nicely in those categories and there's no um, there's no leaving those categories and um, what's interesting about this is in medicine we do a lot of essentializing um, it's part of the work we have to do to kind of quickly triage some patients and so we're taught how to how to how to essentialize but the problem is of course is that humans don't fit nicely into these categories as much as we try to put them into those categories so that can be um, a dangerous pattern um, when we try to essentialize. Another, of course, and I talked about this earlier, is the erasure of context. That's when we fail to consider the socio-historical context when seeking to understand why inequities exist in the first place. Um, and then this concept of biological determinism, which is the false belief that racial groups are biologically and genetically different. Um, again, um, it, it seems so strange to me that in 2021, I have to talk about the idea that biological determinism um, is a false belief um, because it's still something that many people still believe and still feel. Um, a survey that was done for um, uh, several medical students back in 2016 found that medical students have these really false uh, beliefs about biological differences with, between races in which you know, they answered questions believing that black people have thicker skin than white people and that black people have fewer nerve endings than white people. And finally, this idea of cultural determinism, which is the false belief that differences in racial groups are primarily the result of cultural factors. And where we see cultural determinism show up is this idea that um, maybe these differences in outcomes are the result of, for instance, people's diets. Um, you know, certain populations, certain cultural groups, for instance, Latinx group, uh, groups have higher rates of diabetes, perhaps because they just eat a lot of tortillas. Um, this kind of really disturbing trend, again, erases the context of oppression and uh, marginalization and the impacts on health that that has on certain populations. The other thing that's kind of disturbing about cultural determinism is it's just a very short walk away from the concept of cultural deprivation theory, which basically says that certain cultures um, are just so, um, they, they exist in such horrible conditions um, that their, their entire kind of uh, selves are poorly, their culture is, is deprived. And as a result, you see these very bad outcomes because certain populations just have such horrible lives um, that they really um, are not to blame for the fact that, that they have all these uh, negative outcomes. And that's um, a very um, kind of concerning um, walk to, from cultural determinism to cultural deprivation theory. So another self-reflection question for the group. What were the theories of biological and cultural determinism that I was taught in my medical and psychiatric education and training. And I think that if we spend some time thinking about that, we may um, come up with and identify certain times when um, explanations for differences in certain groups were really kind of emphasized as some sort of biological or genetic or cultural difference between those groups. So another um, thing, another group of concepts that we have to think about is this idea of, of of oppression. So um, there are multiple types of oppression. Iris Marion Young describes them in, um, in her article, The Five Faces of Oppression. One is exploitation, which is the unequal exchange of one group's labor and energies for another group's advantage and advancement. And we see exploitation play out in a number of ways. Of course, slavery is kind of a clear example of exploitation. Um, but we also see exploitation showing up um, in modern days, uh, when we think about human trafficking, or even when you think about current treatment of migrant farm workers or warehouse workers. Cultural imperialism is when we establish the ruling class culture as the norm, and we other all those groups that are not part of the dominant culture. Um, and I find that in mental health, we do this very easily. We, we kind of set 
the ruling class culture as the way to be. Um, and then anybody who doesn't behave like that is considered to have some sort of pathological behavior. Um, on, another example we often see is in research. Um, and, and so in research, we often notice um, that we, uh, when we're calculating odds ratios and rate ratios, we may um, think about uh, establish, we have to establish a reference group. And when we establish that reference group, um, I apologize you all, there is um, leaf blowing outside my window, so I'll, I'll try to talk louder. Um, but when we establish that reference group, we often see um, that when we're thinking about race and ethnicity, the reference group is always white. Um, and I've seen this kind of consistently in every study that I've looked at. It doesn't matter how many people are in that particular study. Um, it really um, has no bearing on um, what the reference group is. The reference group has always been consistently white when I've, when I've noticed that in studies. Powerlessness is when oppressed groups lack power or blocked from routes to gaining power. And we think about powerlessness as it relates to things like voter suppression, um, where um, certain populations are not allowed to effectively represent themselves. Um, and in so doing, they don't have a way to speak up on their behalf and, and they, they lack power. And that is in fact, a very clear form of oppression. Marginalization is when we expel specific groups from meaningful participation in society. Clearly we see that with ma mass incarceration um, as described by Michelle 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 Alexander and the new Jim Crow. Um, but we also see this um, show up in a number of ways historically, including things like Japanese internment, treatment of indigenous populations historically in this country, um, and even um, certain immigration policies like the Chinese Exclusion Act. And finally, violence is, uh, just as it's described, threats and experiences of physical and structural violence. Structural violence, as we know, um, is uh, when harm is done by a group that has power over a group that has less power. Um, and I, I think like a, a perfect example of violence has a lot to do with um, the, how it's, violence is used as a form of oppression has a lot to do with when we think about the concept of inter intersectionality. So we know that rates of violence um, have been trending down consistently for, for many years in the United States. But, uh, but one thing that we also know is that transgender people of color um, are in fact at, uh, at epi dying from epidemic rates of, of violence in, in those communities. And it, it shows that a particular population that has been marginalized and has been uh, oppressed is at great threat for, for this particular type of oppression. So, so we must define structural racism. It is a system in which public policies, institutional practices, cultural representations, and other norms work in various often reinforcing ways to perpetuate racial group inequity. This system identifies dimensions of our history and culture that have allowed privileges associated with whiteness and disadvantages associated with color to endure and adapt over time. It is not something that a few people or institutions choose to practice. Instead, it's been a feature of the social, economic, and political systems in which we all exist. And it does not require the actions or intentions of others. And what that means is if we got rid of all of the interpersonal discrimination that exists in society today, we would still see racial and ethnic inequities due to the persistence of structural racism. So now let's talk about a couple of examples um, of how we see social injustice and structural racism show up in mental health. Um, of course, we just talked about crack cocaine, so um, there's not really a need to go into more, more detail about the war on drugs. Um, but residential segregation is a very clear way that we see um, structural racism um, show up in mental health. Um, residential segregation, as you know, relates to redlining, relates to um, the, the federal government designating certain neighborhoods, um, especially neighborhoods that were occupied by people of color as, um, as poor areas in, in investment um, and neighborhoods that were predominantly white were seen as, as good areas in investment. And what you saw is that in, in creating this, these policies, not only were those areas designated as, as poor investments, but they were also disinvested in. Um, and so you saw almost like a withdrawal of services happening and, and supports happening in those communities. Um, so so the, the far reaching implications of re residential segregation is that we see lots of neighborhoods in the United States that have no access to healthcare or mental health care services. You see places um, 
where um, that are predominantly neighborhoods of color that um, are health professional shortage areas. There are no psychiatrists or no mental health clinics for um, long distances, but also more recently, we've seen residential segregation show up as it relates to COVID um, vaccinations. Um, and a study showed that um, people of color and particularly black people in Southern, in many Southern um, counties have to drive significantly farther to get to the first COVID vaccination site than the average person living in a predominantly white community. What, what is helpful here is, again, that's a structural explanation from structural racism for why people have less access to COVID vaccines. And one of the things we love to talk about when we think about COVID vaccination and why rates are lower for certain populations is we say, oh, these particular populations um, culturally are mistrustful of healthcare and they don't want to get vaccines um, because they don't... Um, you know, they don't believe in, in the healthcare system and they don't trust the healthcare system. So applying a very kind of intrinsic explanation. And I'm not saying that that has no bearing at all. It certainly is one factor that is contributing to lower rates of, of COVID vaccines, but um, we don't spend as much time focusing on the structural um, or the intrinsic uh, structural level barriers that are also um, making uh, major contributions to why we see this poor access. Immigration policy is when we see um, that certain um, populations, particularly people immigrating from certain countries, are much e have a much easier route to become immigrants in this country compared to other populations. So we see whole countries being excluded um, based on um, our, our current immigration policies. But more than just countries, we also see um, that immigrants have to undergo um, extensive physical and mental health screenings to, de to determine if they are acceptable to come in this country. And one of the things that we don't do is we don't accept, uh, as a matter of policy, we don't accept people that have um, severe mental health problems or substance use disorders. So as a result, um, uh, we are really taking the most healthiest people that come from, immigrate from certain countries. Um, and then uh, we talk about things like the healthy immigrant effect. And again, we attribute um, the fact that immigrants have better health often than people um, that are native born in the United States. We, we often attribute that to um, perhaps it's a difference in cultures, perhaps it has something to do with um, their family values and, and um, you know, their dietary choices as part of their culture. But it has a lot more to do with the fact that we are screening and um, prohibiting certain people from coming into the country. So it's our policies that are really driving um, the healthy immigrant effect. The Social Security Act of 1935 is this act that stated um, that retired um, older adults could retire and if they worked in the system, they could really um, pay, uh, pay into the system by working. And at the end of that payment, they would, um, at the end of that time, when it was time to retire, they would have money that they could pass on to their children and their, and their grandchildren in the form of retirement benefits. So it was a great act, um, but the reason that we say that it is um, uh, an example of structural racism is in order to get this act passed, um, Southern senators required that it exclude domestic and agricultural workers. And the domestic and agricultural workers um, of the South were all um, generally black people. Um, and so what happened is that black people were excluded from the Social Security Act. They were not able to get retirement benefits in older adulthood. They were not able to pass wealth on to their children and grandchildren. And what we, we saw is this huge opening of the wealth gap and widening of the wealth gap as a result of this very helpful and very important act that was passed that was supposed to benefit all Americans. And finally, if we talk about mental health care, um, this is data from 2018 and SAMHSA, and um, they found that uh, in 2018, 69% of Black adults and 67% of Latinx adults with any mental illness received no treatment. Um, and when we look at serious mental illness, we found they found that 42% of Black adults and 44% of Latinx adults with serious mental illness received no treatment whatsoever. Um, and then when we think about substance use, the numbers are really quite disturbing as 89% of Latinx adults with substance use disorders reported reported receiving no treatment, and 88% of Black adults with substance use disorders received no treatment whatsoever. 
So when we stop and we think a little bit about what is happening here, why in fact are we seeing these really high rates of not accessing services? Again, if we fall into this kind of disparities explanation for why we see this, uh, these differences, again, we might default to thinking that perhaps these particular populations have a lot more stigma. Um, perhaps culturally, um, they're less open to receiving treatment. And perhaps um, they have less insight collectively um, than majority populations or the dominant population. Perhaps um, they um, need help, but they really just don't want to get those services. And these are explanations that we think of time and time again, and we talk about, and we, we, we've spent a lot of time and effort trying to intervene to educate communities and to help them understand the importance of seeking treatment for their conditions. Um, but when we asked, when they asked um, people specifically why they weren't getting these services, cost was the most commonly cited reason for not seeking care. And it was actually twice as often as minimizing symptoms and nearly five times as often as stigma as the reason why people didn't get health care, the reason why Black people in particular did not get health care. And so uh, again, this is a structural reason um, related to the fact that we have designed a mental health care system that does not support the majority of people in the United States and does not allow people to access mental health services um, effectively or quickly. And so cost is the most commonly cited reason. It's not these internal things. Um, and again, I'm not saying we don't need to spend some time trying to um, decrease stigma and trying to educate people, but where is the time and the effort that we're putting into addressing these structural level problems to, to try and um, affect these uh, inequities that we see. And so with the time I have left, let's talk about possible solutions. Um, so currently, as I've de described it, um, we are in this state of inequality. Um, we have unequal access to opportunities and certain patients um, do not get the same and don't have the same outcomes. Uh, many people think that where we need to go is to the state of equality. Equality is really focused on fairness. Um, and we, and I, I see when we talk a lot about inequities and, and disparities, many times people say like, whatever we do, whatever, whatever intervention we do, we just need to make sure that we're fair, that we give the same intervention to any population because that's kind of the most important thing. The problem of course with that is when you evenly distribute tools and assistance, you, you end up seeing what, what you see here in this figure that not everybody gets what they need. Um, so one of the goals is um, equity, and that's when we give custom tools um, specifically to the populations that need it to identify and address the inequality. And that's one step. And as you can see, that gets us closer to where we need to be, but it still doesn't get us to where we need to go. So we actually have to combine equity with justice. And justice is about fixing the system to offer equal access to both tools and opportunities. And so we have to do this combination of equity and justice if we're going to get to where we need to go. And so one of the things that we need to do, um, many of the things that we need to do are, are listed here. And so I'll go through each of those really quickly. Um, the first is really about education and self-reflection. So we've been doing some mini self-reflection so far. Um, and I think that like, again, doing that work, really asking yourself to kind of dig deep and understand kind of what's going on inside you is a really important practice. But also I think another really important practice is to recognize that we are not traditionally taught any of the concepts that we are, that I'm, that I'm going over today. Um, and so it, it's on us to educate ourselves. Um, and so there are a number of books that really help to understand um, help us to understand greater um, exactly what are driving these things. And I think that all of these books are, that I'm recommending here are really well written and really lay out all of these concepts really effectively. So I highly encourage people to start to work towards building their educational knowledge in this space. And I will just also say that we're all very busy people. And so if you don't have the time to read a number of books, there are still many other ways that you can um, get this information and you can move towards this state of really um, um, 
increase in your knowledge in this area. There are a number of podcasts that really explain these concepts really well. Particularly, I would highly recommend the Seeing White podcast and the 1619 Project podcast. There are a number of books that I consider to be much easier reads than the previous reads. So um, there are books that you can read that are um, less intensive, um, but still uh, help to increase your knowledge. And then um, there are also a number of documentaries um, and movies that can really help increase your knowledge. Um, and so, so I encourage people to um, uh, consider multimedia options for expanding their education. And then I have another self-reflection question, which is how much time have I committed to learning additional information about these topics, especially considering that they're not traditionally taught in educational settings. So I wanna make a difference. I wanna move in the direction where I'm actually trying to change um, and address the injustice that I see in my um, work settings. But how much time have I spent actually trying to gather this extra information and to really educate myself so that I'm knowledgeable about how to go about um, addressing these topics? And so another thing that we have to do around the education space is learn and apply cultural humility. So cultural humility is this concept that was created by Melanie Turvalon and my colleague and friend at UC Davis, Jan Marie Garcia. Um, it, it has three tenets. The first is that we have to commit to a lifelong process of self-evaluation and self-critique. And really what we're saying there is that this learning kind of never ends. Um, we really end up um, committing to working on this for the rest of our lives. It's, un, it's not like cultural competence where you um, have this idea that you take this class and all of a sudden you're competent and you get a certificate because you know how to deal with these concepts. It's really um, constant learning and constant growth in this space. Um, the other uh, tenant of cultural humility is having a genuine desire to fix power imbalances between providers and clients, because many of the power imbalances that we have set up, um, these kind of systems of oppression that we have set up in the ways that we interact with our patients are not particularly helpful and, and serve to kind of perpetuate the harm that is done. And then finally, it's, a, it's about developing community partnerships to advocate within the larger organizations with which we participate. And then in addition to cultural humility, we have to merge that with an understanding of, of structural competence. Structural competence is a concept created by my colleagues, Jonathan Metzl and Helena Hansen. Um, this is the trained ability to discern how a host of issues defined as symptoms clinical problems, attitudes, or diseases um, are influenced by upstream social determinants of health. Um, and so it's really about learning to, to exercise this muscle of when a client comes and sits down in front of you, in addition to doing all of the number of assessments and, and evaluations that you do, you're also understanding what is the role of all of those social determinants I talked about earlier? What is the role of those things in these people's, in this person in front of me's life? And how have those things also contributed to the development of these many symptoms and clinical problems that I'm seeing right now? And so um, that's education and self-reflection, but I also mentioned that we have to address public policies and we have to address social norms because that's really the fundamental foundational cause of, of these uh, differences. So first we must promote social norms of inclusion, equity, and respect. And how do we go about doing that? One, um, we all have to kind of start policing social norms and we have to enforce social norms of inclusion and equity. Um, and so just looking around in our family units, um, in our work settings, we need to make sure that we're really practicing um, and moving towards and constantly striving for inclusion and equity. Um, we also um, need to either educate or legislate to change social norms. And what I mean by that is that there's consistently always because um, of a lack of knowledge there's consistently people that are gonna be violating social norms of inclusion and equity. And for that, um, many times the people that are violating these social norms of inclusion 
um, are doing so because they just don't have enough information. Um, they're just kind of ignorant about these topics and they have limited experience kind of interacting with, with people. Um, so in those situations, I think the opportunity there is to educate, to, to take some time um, and to help people kind of come along in their knowledge. I actually think this is a lot of work to be done um, specifically by white people who are further along in their knowledge. Um, um, I think it's the responsibility of white people to educate white people who have less knowledge in these topics. Um, so education can be very powerful, um, but also legislation. Um, so there is a small number of people that um, no matter ever, no, no amount of um, education is ever going to change um, their belief system um, and the idea that certain groups are inferior to other groups. And thankfully, we have laws that prevent people from harming um, others when they share those beliefs and when they can't be, those belief systems can't be changed. And so we use those laws to prevent people um, from discriminating against people, to prevent um, people, for instance, from educating people. Um, and so I would say, like, uh, use those, uh, use laws um, when we can, use policies to keep people from harming um, others in, in these settings. Also, this work involves observing and challenging your own biases and norms. Um, that again is hard work. Um, the more you start to identify your, your implicit bias, um, the more you begin to um, kind of notice how often you um, have implicit bias, how often your bias is, is activated. And um, then you become, I think, a little bit disappointed because the whole idea behind implicit bias is these are, these are kind of intrinsic things that you don't have a lot of control over. So um, your biases often um, are not consistent with your own personal values. And I think that, that I find that um, as I do this work, I can get discouraged by the ways in which I notice um, my own bias behavior kind of rearing up in me. Um, and so I would just encourage people that when you're um, working on identifying bias and identifying um, your own norms around certain populations and groups that you also provide yourself a little bit of grace um, and the understanding that um, these are kind of intrinsic um, neurobiological processes, processes that we all have. And finally, I think it's important for us, again, to look at and break down any unnecessary hierarchies. And that's across our work settings. That's across our families. Um, it's really about like, how do we um, make sure that that power is a power and power structures are in place when they need to be, but when they don't need to be, that we're not um, unfortunately kind of using it as a, as a form of oppression. And then if we're gonna advocate for equitable public policies. Um, that work involves taking action beyond our clinical settings and moving beyond our, our clinics and hospitals and treatment centers into community settings. Um, and so that, and in those community settings, the work that we have to do is advocate for policies that address the social determinants of mental health. Um, we really need to communicate with our elected officials and really promote equitable representation, allowing communities to represent their own interests and own needs. Again, you can do this on multiple levels. This can happen in um, a work setting. It can happen in a department. Um, one of the things that we're, we're working on in my department is making sure we develop a community advisory board that helps to inform um, all of the activities happening in the department so that the needs of the community are reflected in the values and in the work that we do. Um, but also um, this could be at the, the federal government level. So um, forming relationships with um, current politicians and helping um, to pass laws that are more equitable um, and, uh, and, and supporting candidates that are, that are um, focused on equity. And then we have to teach advocacy um, and, and encourage our own advocacy, but also help others to become advocates. And part of that is by centering the voices of experts, people with lived experience, people who um, are uh, knowledgeable and the experts of their own experiences, but also the experts of their communities. And so we really need to be able to elevate those populations whenever we have the opportunity to do so. And so um, in wrapping up, I just want to um, mention that last um, thing that we have to do is this idea of speaking up and taking a stand. Um, and so I, I want to remind everybody 
that in doing this work and trying to get to this place of mental health equity, that political stances and policy interventions are required. Because if you remain apolitical or neutral, that is in fact a political stance because you are tacitly accepting the status quo. Um, and so with that, this quote um, from Audre Lorde, I think really helps to kind of drive that particular point home. Um, she said that when we speak, we are afraid our words will not be heard nor welcomed, but when we are silent, we are still afraid, so it's better to speak. And so I would encourage everybody as we're working through um, these difficult topics to recognize the power that you have um, and how when you see injustice happening that you can actually speak up and speak out against it and that will move us in the direction we need to go. And so to end, I would just like to say that we are currently in the state of um, progress. Um, progress is made often through the passage of legislation, through court rulings, formal mechanisms that aim to promote racial equality. And we've had so much progress over the last, um, you know, hundreds of years. And, and, and we can get very excited about the fact that we're making so much progress. But I have to remind everybody that with progress always comes retrenchment. And ret retrenchment refers to the ways in which progress is very often challenged, neutralized or undermined in key policy arenas. And if we're not prepared for that, I, you know, right now we're in these, we're in an area and a time of deep retrenchment and many of the policies that are being passed are really oppressive policies. Um, if we're not prepared for retrenchment, um, I think we can get very overwhelmed and we can start to despair. And, and so to end, I would like to leave us, uh, leave you all with the words of Congressperson John Lewis. Um, he said, do not get lost in a sea of despair, be hopeful, be optimistic. Our struggle is not the struggle of a day, a week, a month, or a year. It is the struggle of a lifetime. Never ever be afraid to make some noise and get in good trouble, necessary trouble. And so that, that I thank you for your time. And I think we have some time for questions. Uh, Dr. Shim, thank you so much for a extremely brilliant and thoughtful and wise uh, presentation. Everybody out there will now get started with some uh, questions and answers. We have a question already in the chat. Please go ahead and uh, put some more questions in the chat. And I'm going to turn to you, Amir, to, to get us started. Uh, if the questions come to your mind, I, I certainly have many and could probably want to talk to you for hours, Dr. Shim, uh, many, many hours. So thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll limit mine to one question. Dr. Garakani. Uh, yes, I, I know one question came in from Dr. Gerber, and I'll, I'll let you handle that, Jeff. Uh, but mm -hmm. I, I just wanted to thank you so much, Dr. Shim. Uh, one of the things that, that struck me, and there are two things that are that kind of weighed on me as I was listening to you talk. One is the way that people within our society, and not just um, white people primarily, but not just white people, but even people like myself who were the, the children of immigrants who grew up in a fairly well-to-do environment, how much we have benefited from these constructs and the area of like even deciding where to send my son to school and having people say, well, you don't want to send him to school in this town because the town doesn't have a very good school district, which means because there are a lot of minorities in this school district. And I was like, well, how did it happen that the school district in Stanford, Connecticut isn't quite as necessarily good as, as the school districts one town or two towns over? I was like, oh, this is, was created many years ago with self-segregation and uh, and obviously people don't want to be the one to, to have to stand up to it by saying, well, I don't want my son or my child to suffer. I don't want to get inferior health care by going to a system where I might have to wait in a clinic with other patients that I don't want to wait with. And so I guess my question to you is how do we combat it when there the people who will are instrumental in, in over, overturning and undoing it are, are benefiting from the system that's been created? How do we get them to realize that it's, they're not doing a service to the people of color who've been oppressed over many years? That's a million dollar question, Dr. Karakani. And um, I, I think, um, I, and again, I think some of the scholars that I, um, that I mentioned their books, um, they have tried to grapple with some of those issues. So, so the first thing I, I'm thinking about when you're asking your, your great question is that, um, that Isabel Wilkerson kind of highlights very well in cast how um, uh, people of color who are not black people, 
um, also benefit from the caste system. Um, and so, you know, as you described as, as being the child of immigrants and how you have benefited while not being a white person, I think she really well, uh, well lays out so well how we have these three castes in, in the United States and, and we, have the, we have white people, we have kind of everybody else and we have black people and how everybody else in that middle category is really driving and perpetuating the caste system by trying their best to distance themselves as much as possible from black people at the bottom of the caste and trying to align themselves as much as possible with white people. And that even comes down to decisions that you make about where your son goes to school, right? And, and so it, it, it becomes this, this extreme challenge of how do I address a structural issue? Um, and and is, does my individual work take down um, structurally racist policies. Um, and so and so I am I advocate for the idea that we actually cannot break down structurally racist policies as much on the individual level. So the work is not necessarily like, while there are definitely people that do this work, and I, I think that they are to be commended for it, um, putting their children in schools that are considered to be um, worse schools because of resident because of the lasting effects of residential segregation. While that work is um, important, and if we had everybody doing that work, we could solve this problem really quickly. Um, there are not enough people that are willing to do this work. And so instead of, instead of that um, approach, I think a, a more effective approach is to implement large scale policies on a federal level, on a local um, level that start to um, think about racial equity and think about how do we change the funding that's going to these school systems? How do we change the resources that are going to these schools? And again, that's not necessarily work of the average psychiatrist, but the way the psychiatrist can show up is by showing up at community meetings, um, investing in and making sure that uh, the right officials are elected um, that are moving in that space um, backing and, and maybe even running for office um, at higher levels, that that's where that work um, gets done. But I, I, I definitely, definitely don't want to imply that that's not a really difficult challenge because this work is really, really hard. Um, the, the last thing I'll say about this is that um, the other book that I recommended was The Sum of Us by Heather McGee. And she talks a lot in that book about how we have been kind of fed this idea of a, a zero sum system um, in which if, um, if we help certain racial groups advance, if we, hurt, if we help black people in this country advance, that means others will lose. Um, and, and she really lays out this idea that that's actually not true. Um, but we have been so good at like believing that argument that we, we've come to the place where we kind of think that that's the case. And so we prevent we prevent the um, advancement and the assistance of improving outcomes for black people because we're worried that, that we will um, all kind of lose in that process. Thank you so much, Ruth. And you're right, the, the data seems to support schools with greater diversity, the students tend to do better. <laughs> That data is highlighted in Heather McGee's book. Um, yeah. It's like any, and the more, the more diverse your school is, by far the better outcomes. And she has a whole chapter on this, how um, when you take your child out of the rich, predominantly white school and put them in a community school that um, is diverse, that they end up being happier, they end up being smarter, um, and they end up like having better outcomes. Thank you so much. And it is go does go to, and I just, this is the last thing I'm going to say, it does go to the idea of, of people growing up in diverse environments, because you talked about this, it's like, you know, I look at my son, I'm like, well, this is, you know, you don't become a racist. You're not born this way to understand differences. But if he's not around people of different colors and ethnic backgrounds, he doesn't grow up in a diverse community and is around diversity, I think it does become harder the older he gets to understand racial differences. Like I have friends I went to, to, to college and medical school with who grew up in small towns in middle America where there were no black people or Hispanic people, Jewish people, and they go to, they end up at a at a big college and they're like, they like, they feel like they're out of their world almost. And especially because then all the information that informs their knowledge of that, those populations are what they see in the media. And, yeah. and if, if everything that informs your knowledge of a group is what is um, 
reflected in the media, you're in trouble. Um, and I and I actually a, a really good example of this relates to transgender people, um, because transgender people um, there's a there's a, a documentary on Netflix called Disclosure, which talks about the ways that transgender people are depicted in the media um, throughout history. And it is shocking and disturbing because what happens is if you've never met a transgender person, you don't recognize that they are just like anybody, like, like all of us, we are all the very same types of people. Um, but, but if all you have is the depiction of media to, to you, you can get a, to a very, very disturbing Place. And I see this over and over to the point that um, I can't even, you know, I, I, I was at um, just a, a, a funny little aside. I was at a winery um, having um, uh, drinking wine with my best friend from medical school and we're both two black women. And um, the woman who was um, our, our, our white, the white woman who was um, taking care of us and serving us our wine, she really could not comprehend what we were doing there. Like she really struggled to understand why we were at this winery, why we were drinking wine, what kind of wine we like to drink. Were, were, were we drinking like regular wine, like, like other people just couldn't, she could not get past the fact that, um, that like the idea that black people could have the same experiences as white people um, and have, and like the same things as white people. And again, I think that's because she did not interact with a lot of black people. And so she had an, a perception of what they were like and, and we could not, she couldn't move past like her, her incorrect assumption of what she expected us to be. Thank you so much for sharing that. So much, uh, so much I could say. Uh, <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'm ready for a long cup of coffee here. Um, yes. So I, but I'm gonna turn to the Q and A. I'm gonna start with Dr. Uh, Dr. Gerber's uh, question. So I wish Andrew that you could actually uh, ask this, but in this format, I'm going to just read it, everyone. So um, Dr. Gerber says, thank you, Dr. Shim, for an incredibly important Grand Rounds. I feel that this is especially important and timely for Silver Hill as we reckon with our own history and ongoing elements of systemic racism. I'd like to ask your advice about one of the problems I've found most vexing. As you know, for some, even highly educated and privileged individuals, the acceptance of the notion of racism as a systemic problem that we have to explore in ourselves and in our institutions is a very hard thing to accept. I find that I can get stuck in these conversations by someone saying to me, sure, there's racism, but I'm not a racist and it's not fair to call our institution historically racist. I end up feeling a bit like a therapist trying to persuade a patient of the unconscious mind. That is, you may not consciously realize that racism is in you and in your institution, but here's the evidence. Just as in therapy, this tends not to be effective. How do you recommend we talk with people about unconscious and systemic racism when they have trouble acknowledging this possibility for a range of their own reasons? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> it's a wonderful question. And it's, cha it's challenging. Again, it's one of those questions that um, I, if I had the answer. Um, so I, I think there's a couple of things here. So, so one... Um, I, I very much feel that, um, again, some of, some of the lack of, of knowledge around this issue, um, the, so first of all, it gets back to the idea that it's just really difficult to talk about race. Um, it's really difficult to talk about race. It's really difficult to talk about racism. It is wrapped up in so many other kind of deep aspects of our identity. Um, and so I think that the, the best approach um, is one of recognizing that it's not one conversation. Um, it's not gonna be one conversation with somebody. It's gonna be multiple, multiple conversations over years and years and years to take somebody's entire worldview and, and like what they have known their entire life. You're asking people to take what they have known their entire life and, and shift the fund, a fundamental worldview. And that is, a, that is a tall order to ask somebody. But I firmly believe that, um, I firmly believe one, that for this issue, um, it's, it's again, I think very much work that white people need to do. Um, so white people who are farther along and who really understand these concepts and are bringing these conversations need to have loving conversations with other white people helping to slowly move them in the direction 
that they begin to have greater understanding around this space. And, and I, I think that that is, um, I don't think it is work that people of color can do because I think it's very easy to dismiss people of color in this space. But I, I have found and I have noticed that um, I have um, many white people that I know that are very effective at um, having a lot of patience, a lot of tolerance and a lot of space and love um, to help certain people move along. And, and part of the issue here is that it actually relates to, again, another book I referenced was Beverly Daniel Tatum, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? That book talks about racial identity development. Um, and I think it's very helpful. Again, we were not taught about the concept of racial identity development with all of our teachings about all of the developmental phases of, of life. Racial identity development was not taught, but it's a really significant part of where people are when you're having this conversation with them, where they are in their racial identity development. Um, and once you can kind of like uh, identify where that is, you can help to start move people, to move people along in that development stage. Now, that being said, so, so the word is lots of patience, lots of love, lots of tolerance. This is work that white people need to do. And they have to kind of, I think, understand where people are in their development and help move them along. Um, but, that being said, there is also some people that will never move, no matter how much time and energy you spend trying to convince them, trying to get them to that space. And this is what I said before, and I, I, I just want to reiterate it. It's fine. Don't spend time trying to convince those people of things that they're not going to move on. But what's very important is that those people are not in positions of power where they can harm others. And so the work then becomes making sure people are not um, harming people in those roles and that they, that they are not, um, they're not allowed to rise to a level of power that they can do harm collectively on a large group of, pe of people. I, I think you're muted, Dr. Katzman. I am, I just used 20 seconds of our remaining <laughs> five minutes here uh, um, with some great questions. Um, so I, I just wanna uh, put out Dr. Tamron's question there. What, what's allowed you to be so comfortable talking about something that's so difficult to talk about? Um, I had no choice. Um, I'm a black woman um, in, a, in, a, in a system, in a society um, that uh, has, um, that I, I, I deal with the effects of that every day. Um, and I think that I could either become really angry um, and um, bitter, um, but that that would not really, it's not my personality. Um, so so what it, what's been for me is that I'm, I'm about trying to find solutions to problems. That's, that's how I've always been my entire life. Um, and so this is a problem and um, I'm, I'm, I'm by, by trying to find the solution, it's actually allowed me to kind of really understand the problem and recognize again that we have to have a lot of patience um, for how entrenched and how big this problem is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and so uh, Kenneth Burr uh, says, thank you for a comprehensive and deep look at the most critical issue in our country. Ever given the longstanding history going back to the very foundation of the nation, working on this issue will cross generations. What do you recommend about the immediate crisis involving vac vaccine reluctance and refusal in minority communities. Specifically, I've had several patients who've been helped very much by Jamaican and Haitian AIDS who were willing to leave their employment because they refuse. Yeah, and so again, I think that we have to be thinking about these things structurally um, and not thinking about them individually. Um, so, you know, refusal, I think there, there needs to be some thought about that and the, about even the way that we're kind of categorizing it, right? Um, so part of it, I think, you know, yes, there is, again, some cultural refusal, but um, you can look at uh, a majority of white people um, in this country who are also refusing the COVID vaccine. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, I think that there are specific reasons for that population too. Um, so so I, I don't know if this is necessarily um, I, I, I don't want us to like take that the, the tack that these particular populations are kind of refusing the vaccine because they don't have kind of good reasons for it as much as I think it's more helpful to look at what are the structural barriers that are preventing people from getting access to the vaccine 
that that um, and what are the structural barriers that are preventing people from communities of color from accessing the vaccine? And I think that there are a lot of structural barriers that are keeping people of color from, from accessing the vaccine. One of the areas um, I think that the, 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 the person asking the question touches on something really important here, which is um, uh, trusted members of the community can reach people. Um, and they can convince people. And one of the problems that we have in our healthcare system is that the people that are providing services to populations of color and to oppressed and marginalized populations are not those people from those communities. And so the work that we have to do on a systems and a structural level is to change the, the, the look of the workforce. Um, that in every setting that you work in clinically, the, the staff in that setting should reflect the demographics and the cultural backgrounds of the people that live in that community. Um, and so the structural work becomes how do we hire more people from this community to work in this setting? And that's where I think you can make a lot of impact around COVID vaccinations by changing hiring pro, uh, practices and, and employing people from those communities to, to directly interact with those communities and address whatever um, kind of belief systems that are, that are driving any of these differences. Thank you. There's still unanswered questions out there. I have some, I think we could all, uh, if we were together in a room, have so many productive conversations. So Dr. Shim, I just, I just want to thank you so much uh, for being here with us today. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. And I want to remind you, uh, for those wishing to receive CME and CEC credits, please complete the evaluation survey that will automatically pop up in the browser as the webinar ends. And we will all also email you a copy. So this concludes our grand rounds and I will warn you that the end of the virtual grand rounds is a little abrupt as well. We're all left alone in our, uh, in our places of work or homes, uh, wondering how, how that was and wanting to connect more. So goodbye everyone. Thank you for being here and see you next week. Thanks.